The season's done. Fury. Oh, shoot. Okay. Hello, everybody. Welcome back. Oh, my gosh. This is the last video for Unit 4. Wow! Yay! Hooray! God bless America. Oh, my God. I'm so happy. The last video of this semester. Can you believe it, my friends? Oh, my goodness gracious me. One video Oh my God, we are almost done. Jeez Louise, Jiminy Christmas, cheese and rice. Oh my gosh, aren't we so happy? Awesome, awesome apple freaking possum. I think I am going to record, re-record some videos for uh, uh, the future units, but for the most part, I'm fairly satisfied with the explanations I gave in those particular uh, chapters for semester two. So I might make a few adjustments going forward, but for the most part, I think the videos are pretty uh, accurate. Um, uh, well, obviously they're accurate in the sense that they're delivering the correct content but i think they're accurate in the sense that they're going to cover what you need to know for your unit tests and for the ap so big changes on the way well not any big changes actually the opposite of that there's not going to be very big changes but there might be some uh reworkings of videos i'm going to rewatch some of them uh make sure that they're up to standard in my humble opinion well, enough introduction and screaming out of the way. Yes, indeed, as my excitement and jubilation of earlier videos noted, uh, or uh, earlier in this video, I should say, we are going to begin our conclusion of Unit 4, and we're going to look at the collapse of the Ming Dynasty and the rise of China's last imperial dynasty, the Qing Dynasty. Bell work on the screen. What is motivating Japanese imperial or isolationism? You should be able to answer. Use specific terms. I cannot underscore how much you people need to use specific terms in answering these things. Use names like the Jesuits, not Christian missionaries. The Jesuits. God. Oh my God. You people need to be specific. All right. So let's keep going anyway, after I am done berating you. So let's talk about China. Let's talk about the end of the Ming Dynasty. We'll do a little bit of review about them. And then the rise of the Qing Dynasty. And this is going to be actually the imperial flag of the Qing Dynasty. Um, I like it because it looks like the dragon dropped a ball or something. But anyway, let's get going. We are going to continue this lesson objective of how do empires form what are their political systems? What policies do they create? And again, we are looking at East Asian societies and how they react to European maritime presence. So pay attention to how China is interacting with Europe, not just in the Ming dynasty, but in the Qing dynasty as well. Let's get forward. Let's end the Ming dynasty. If you hate Neo-Confucianism, guess what? This dynasty is going to end. But let's review who the Ming dynasty are. Well, let's get started with it. Well, remember, the Ming dynasty do form largely in response to the Mongol presence in China, the Yuan dynasty. So the Ming dynasty forms largely in reaction to outside invaders, expelling them and creating an ethnically Chinese Chinese dynasty. And the Ming Dynasty is going to be characterized by a few things. Some of them are relevant for our today's discussion, for today's discussion, I should say. We do see that under the Ming Dynasty, there is a revival of the civil service exam. There is Neo-Confucianism, baby. We are seeing a strict bureaucratic system under the Ming Dynasty. Remember, the Yuan Dynasty got rid of this civil service exam. Guess what? The Ming Dynasty, bring it back. The influence of Neo-Confucianism is a major continuity in Chinese dynastic history, and certainly the Ming Dynasty are a demonstration of that. Not only is their political system, their government system of a civil service bureaucracy going to be influenced by Confucian texts, 
we are also going to see that this neo-Confucianism will extend to foreign policy. And that foreign policy is largely going to characterize Chinese isolationism. So we do see the development of an isolationist foreign policy in the Ming dynasty. And that is indeed going to characterize the relationship between China and the outside world under the Ming dynasty. Remember, Neo-Confucianism stresses kind of obedience to the state. It stresses obedience to tradition, to Chinese tradition, to Chinese hierarchy. And we do see that Neo-Confucianism will not only predominate internal government structures, but foreign policy as well. Remember, 1433, cancel Sangha expeditions, cancel overseas exploration, cancel those overseas tribute states. So we do see that kind of China, while it will continue to have a trading presence in Southeast Asia, in East Asia with Korea and Japan, we do see a kind of limiting of China's overseas presence. We certainly are also going to see restrictions on foreigners within China, a decline of the Silk Road trade as a result of Neo-Confucianism, and that opposition to outside foreign influence. However, despite the fact we do see within the Ming Dynasty a general preference for Neo-Confucian isolationism, we do see that a few things will upset that. And one of those things that upsets that is going to be the fact that Europe has something China wants. After 1492, that's the only day I believe you should absolutely memorize in this class. Actually, that's not true. There are a few dates. 15, uh, excuse me, 1453, fall of Constantinople. 1492, and I'm sure there's other ones, uh, but we'll get there later. So unsustainable, this desire to limit trade to China. We do see that a few factors will lead to that. For one thing, the exploration of the New World, the colonization of the New World, is leading to silver production in Spanish Portuguese colonies. And this silver is being used by Spain and Portugal to purchase things from China. So the influx of gold and silver bullion to Europe is leading to Europe having the stuff China wants to trade. And as a result of that, we will see that China is actually going to kind of loosen some of its isolation policies. For another thing, isolationism in general is difficult to enforce. There's always going to be smuggling. Everybody wants stuff from other places. You can't have a 100% closed off society. And China certainly was not closed off, even though it attempted to be. However, we do see that the influence of Neo-Confucianism is going to prevent truly free markets. We are going to see that Neo-Confucianism is going to try and limit that desire for trade as much as possible. We will see the Ming Dynasty will limit European traders to the port city of Macau. The Portuguese actually will take over the city of Macau through threats and bribery. And we do see that this will become a, a Portuguese trade post city, a Portuguese port city that Portugal will control actually well into the 20th century. So the presence of Europeans in small trading communities like Macau, that is going to be something we first see under the Ming dynasty. However, it is important to understand kind of how Europe is becoming more involved within China. Certainly, we are going to see that Europeans are definitely interested in Chinese goods. That is a continuity in world history from Unit 2 and Unit 1. The desire by Europeans for Chinese goods, things like silk, things like tea, things like porcelain. Not so much gunpowder, but tea porcelain and silk. These are the three biggest commodities Europeans want from the Chinese. So the decline of the Ming dynasty, as we're going to see in a second, is going to happen by the 1600s. We do see instance of decentralization falling apart, and that is going to kind of show to Europeans, hey, there's 
a weakened state that's going to not prevent us from being there, we do see kind of Europe will be more aggressive in having a presence within China. And certainly in order to kind of butter up, to use that terminology from the previous video, to butter up and influence the Chinese to be more accepting of European merchants, we do see this spread of missionaries, specifically the Jesuits. And I said specifically because you need to be specific in your assignments for goodness gracious sake. European missionaries are going to enter into China as a result of political decentralization, as a result of the Ming dynasty's decline. So European missionaries will be present in China. They're essentially there to wow the Chinese dynastic leaders, the Chinese emperors, into allowing more European presence. So we will see Jesuit missionaries specifically in China. Some examples of those are Matteo Ricci, this handsome gentleman right here with the beard, and Johann Adam Charles von Bell. So we do see there are some examples of Europeans going to China to not only convert locals to Catholicism, but also to impress Chinese political leaders into allowing more European presence there. Look, we have all this wonderful science as a result of the scientific revolution. We have things like the astrolabe. We have globes. We have, um, I think this is like a cage or a globe. I don't know. We have all these accurate measurement instruments. We have maps and books and encyclopedias. Wow, look at how intelligent we are. If we have more regular trade contact, maybe you can get some of this technology and scientific learning as well. So we do see that European missionaries will actually be kind of welcomed into China. Chinese political leaders realize the potential benefits of receiving European technology, European scientific discovery. And we do see actually that China in the Ming Dynasty is a bit more receptive towards the end of the Ming Dynasty, I should definitely clarify, will be more receptive to European trading companies. We are going to see that European trading companies, especially European East India companies, they are going to arrange for more preferential treatment in China. They are going to kind of negotiate with the Chinese government to have more special trading statuses. For example... We are going to see the Portuguese in Macau, for example. They purchased that port city from the Chinese government. We see the Dutch in Taiwan, the Dutch, especially their East India Company, the Vaanaga Ost Indische Company. They are going to uh, basically establish a presence in Formosa, what is the old name for Taiwan. They enslave a lot of people there. It's something your book talks about more. But we do see that European trading powers are going to establish post presence, a trade post presence within China. However, the Ming Dynasty is going to collapse, and there are several reasons why the Ming Dynasty will collapse, and these are all those examples right there. For one thing, turns out China took in too much silver. Silver inflation goes kaboom, and that is going to lead to economic decline. That's not necessarily the reason why overland trade declines, but it is a major reason why economic, uh, excuse me, uh, why land-based empires tend to decline is these influx of silver. There's government corruption. The Ming Dynasty has grown corrupt. It's lost the mandate of heaven, one could say. So we do have a lot of corruption. Famines are breaking out and peasants tend to be upset when there's no food. That's just a common rule in world history. There's peasant rebellions. We'll talk about one example in just a second. But another explanation for the Ming Dynasty's decline actually is going to be a series of wars with Japan. Remember, during the unification of the Japanese mainland, the Japanese main island of Honshu, we do see that this Japanese in, uh, militarism is going to expand beyond Japan. We do see the invasion of Korea and China under, um, what's the guy's name? Toyomoti Hidoshi. 
And that is going to lead to a lot of economic and political instability in China. So all of these factors are reasons why the Ming Dynasty will decline. But perhaps the thing that will ultimately kill off the Ming Dynasty, and as we're going to see in a second, lead to the Qing Dynasty, is going to be bad relations with Central Asian nomads, specifically a group known as the Manchu or Manchu. The Manchu are a group of Central Asian nomads who mostly come from modern-day Manchuria, which is in northern China, they are going to have very bad relations with the Ming dynasty. The Ming dynasty is very xenophobic. They are against outsiders, namely Central Asian nomads. They demand tribute from Central Asian nomads. And we do see the Manchu will respond to this expectation of tribute by invading China. And indeed, the Manchu are going to invade Right around the same time, there's a peasant rebellion. So we do see the invasion of China by the Ming Dynasty. They're going to take over the capital city of Beijing. And we are going to see the collapse of the Ming Dynasty. But guess what? The Manchu are intent on staying in China. And they are going to create the Qing Dynasty. And the founder of the Qing Dynasty is this man by the name of Narachi Khan, so a continuity in Central Asian nomadic history, the use of the title Khan, that is going to extend to how Narachi will set up a Chinese imperial dynasty. So that is going to lead us ultimately to the Qing dynasty. The Qing dynasty forms through the invasion of the Ming dynasty by the Manchu people. And the Manchu are heavily associated with the Qing dynasty. If you ever see kind of the name Manchu, associate that with the Qing dynasty. And that's actually going to lead us to the last land-based empire you would need to know for the AP. The land-based empires you need to know for the AP are as follows. You have the Ottomans, Safavids, Mughals, Russians, Chinese under the Qing dynasty. So you should be able to identify specific factors that led to the collapse of the Ming dynasty and some factors that led to the rise of the Qing dynasty. And that leads us to the Qing dynasty, of course. The Qing dynasty actually is going to be our last imperial dynasty in Chinese history, lasting well until the 20th century, actually. They will fall as a result of something we'll talk about in the future, a Chinese revolution, but not a communist one, as we'll see later on. It's the Chinese revolution, however, of 1912 that will lead to the collapse of the Qing dynasty. And yes, the Qing dynasty is a very important dynasty in Chinese history and in general world history. It's a prime example of a land-based empire it's going to have all of the characteristics of a land-based empire. It has a bureaucracy. It has firearms. It has, I'm trying to think of anything else. Well, a land-based empire. It has not an overseas empire. So yes, the Qing dynasty is significant for a variety of reasons. It is a perfect example of a centralized, bureaucratic, land-based empire it's also going to be kind of the last of the Chinese dynasties. It is going to see China at its greatest territorial extent, stretching well into Tibet, modern day to the region in uh, Central Asia known as Tibet. We see the invasion uh, and inclusion of Mongolia, of Manchuria, of Korea as well. And it is going to be, again, a prime example of a land-based empire with a centralized bureaucracy that uses guns. So if you are to compare it to another land-based empire, literally any of them, all of them use strict bureaucracies with efficient taxation systems that allow for gunpowder armies to invade inland territory. And we are going to see kind of that this Qing dynasty will specifically have policies that are going to relate to European overseas expansion. We will see the Qing dynasty will trade with Europe. We will definitely see that. But there is going to be, much like the, China, uh, the Japanese in a way, heavy restrictions on trade. And we're going to look at how that changes over time in just a second. But the Qing dynasty 
absolutely something you would need to know for this class and in the future. And we'll talk about them in, uh, in other videos as well. I think I have a whole video about the decline of the Qing Dynasty. And of course, the Qing Dynasty will end in the 20th century, and we'll, we'll get there later. There's a movie about it, I think. The Last Emperor, I think it's called. And the most important of the Qing dynasties, the rulers, is going to be this handsome gentleman right here, Emperor Kangxi. And of course, I mispronounce everything in this class, so it's fine. And Kangxi is important for a few reasons. For one thing, he's the longest serving ruler in Chinese history, but that's not really all that important. What is important is what he does to China. And it is going to be a period in which we see a lot of technological economic and military advancements in China. For one thing, we do see an improvement to infrastructure. We do see an improvement to structures like uh, the Grand Canal, for example, to basic roads and canal systems. We are going to see that kind of to gain popularity, to fix the problems associated with the previous dynasty in order to secure the mandate of heaven. We see a lowering of taxes cutting of interest rates and rents, and that's going to lead to kind of popular support for the Qing dynasty. It's an attempt to kind of get the ethnically Han Chinese people on board with a ruling Manchu dynasty. The Manchu, remember, they are a Central Asian nomadic group. We're going to see the standardization of Chinese Mandarin, of Mandarin characters, I should say, uh, the creation of a huge variety of literature. But we do see that significant territory will be added to the Chinese dynasty, to the Qing dynasty. We see the conquest of places like Mongolia, Taiwan, Tibet. These are places that will become added to the Chinese imperial territory. However, we do see that the Qing dynasty will become very prevalent in terms of its foreign policy. And we are going to look at a few examples of that in a second. For one thing, we are going to see kind of negotiations with other major land-based empires, namely the Russians. The Russians and the Qing dynasty, they're going to sit down and they're going to form their northern border between themselves. And we do see the creation of the Treaty of Nurchinsk. Uh, this is an example of inter-regional territorial diplomacy so kind of if you ever get a topic about diplomacy in the future here's a prime example of that right here so it does negotiate the border between the chinese and the russians and we do kind of see that something that is unique to the qing dynasty is that compared to the ming or excuse me compared to the japanese i should say we do see a much more welcoming attitude for jesuits we do see that qing dynasty rulers like kangxi actually are going to accept european missionaries these european missionaries kangxi believes can introduce china to improvements to technology to improvements to philosophy However, something that is going to define the Qing dynasty in terms of its relation with overseas empires is going to be the creation of something known as the Canton system. And what is the Canton system? Well, the Canton system is going to be a protectionist policy that is going to encourage, or I should say discourage, European presence outside of the region of Canton, outside specifically the city of Guangzhou. So we do see that this Canton system will restrict Europeans specifically to a smaller part of China, much like how the Japanese restricted individuals to the city of Nagasaki, specifically to the island of Deshima. However, unlike with Japan, there is not this uh, more anti-Catholic bias. We do see that the Jesuits tend to be more accepted into Chinese society. Although, even though Jesuits are accepted into Chinese society, even though they sufficiently, you could say, butter up Chinese imperial rulers to the uh, presence of Europeans, we do see that there is still limitation on where Europeans can trade. So the Canton system is really going to define European and Chinese relations until the 1840s. We will see how that changes in Unit 6. 
But it is important to understand what does Europe want from China? Well, Europe wants a lot of things, namely things like silk, tea, porcelain, not gunpowder. Europe already has gunpowder, dinguses. So it's going to be limited to silk, tea, and porcelain. All right. However, China is going to have a bit of an influence on Europe during this time. We will see there are some examples of Chinese influence on Europe. For example, I swear to the supreme being in the sky, and that's using a deist idea, actually, from the Enlightenment. And there's an example of something from the Enlightenment right there. You need to use specific terms like deism when you're describing the Enlightenment. So we are actually going to see that we will have a lot of impact from Chinese society on European society as well. And here are some specific examples of that. For one thing, the idea of inoculation. And inoculation, essentially, think vaccination. It's not exactly the same thing, but it is very similar. It's essentially introducing a weaker form of the disease into someone's body, and then they gain immunities from it. So for example, oh, a smallpox person, wowee, you got smallpox, isn't that great? Uh, you got a little pustule on your arm right there. I'm going to get this swab, this uh, this little metal thing, I'm going to jam it into you. Oh, look, I'm getting all the, the pus and whatnot. And then I'm going to put it in your arm. Oh, no, you're sick. Oh, that's terrible. But now, now you have a chance of surviving smallpox if you get it again. Isn't that cool? So the idea of inoculation actually will be majorly important. So you could say that is an example of China's influence on Europe uh, that will impact medical history, actually. So that's pretty cool. We also see some examples of impact in terms of philosophy. Uh, and this is going on during the age of the Enlightenment. And we see that actually in the figure of David Hume. David Hume could outconsume William Friedrich Hegel and uh, get it? Okay, none of you get that because it's a Monty Python reference to a specific song called the Philosopher's Song. And we don't talk about philosopher. I mean, we kind of do, but we don't. Uh, we don't talk about it to the same extent as Euro, for example. So we do actually have some examples of that. David Hume was an Enlightenment philosopher who does utilize Buddhist and Confucian thought in his descriptions of the. Uh, of metaphysical world, essentially of the spiritual realm in a way. Well, not exactly spiritual, but the intangible, untouchable realm. So there's an example. Example right there. I swear to God, you need to use the phrase for example, followed by a specific term, a specific person, a specific event, a specific technology. Jesus Christ was an important figure in Christianity. All right. But also another thing that Europeans are interested in is Chinese fashion, quite frankly. Chinese, there is this kind of, um, in, in historic terms, we use the term fetishization of Chinese commodities, of Chinese fashion. So we do kind of see there is an influence on European fashion. Europeans really want Chinese silk screens. They want, China's all the rage. If you want to be cool and popular, you got to have some China, some fine porcelain in your house. All right, so those are some examples of Europe's impact on China. But we're going to see that kind of, the fact that Chinese are so restrictive of trade actually does cause a bit of a diplomatic problem. And we're going to see that more in the future, but we're going to look at some examples now, actually. So we saw that the Qing are largely adopting trade protectionist policies, and trade protectionist policies essentially mean that they want to limit foreign presence within China. They want to limit foreigners entering into China. They want to limit the foreign goods entering China, unless it's silver or really cool Jesuits. However, this is not sitting well with Europe, because remember... Europe is undergoing a development of capitalism. And capitalism, as we're going to learn about next semester, is much more interested in what we call ideas of free trade. The idea there shouldn't be any limits on trade, even if that hurts poor people, but that's besides the point. This idea of breaking protectionism is going to be something Europe will develop by the end of 
of the 1700s, as we'll explore more in Unit 5. So there will be attempts by European powers to try and break the Canton system, to try and open up other European, excuse me, other Chinese ports to European merchant presence without any restrictions. An attempt to actually do that is going to come from the British, actually. After 1700, you call them the British. You call them the British. All right. And one example of that, one example of that is going to be the British East India Company sending this nerd named George McCartney to go over to um, to China and essentially beg the Chinese emperor, hey, can you please open up Beijing to trade with Europeans? Because uh, we British people, we want to sell you really crappy um, manufactured products. So can you open up Beijing to us? But guess what? Because because Europeans are racist? Because Paul, or I almost said Paul McCartney. George McCartney is like, I'm a British person. I'm the culturally superior person in the world. I don't need to kowtow use a connection to earlier units i don't need to bow before the chinese emperor essentially the chinese emperor is going to be like yo dude get out of my country i don't want to see you europeans in beijing you can only go to canton so we do see that there will be some attempts by european powers to break these trade restrictions and yet Prior to the 1800s, many land-based empires are still too dang powerful to resist direct European encroachment, direct European invasion of their territory. We will see how this changes as a result of the Industrial Revolution when Europe gets so many more faster guns and ships. And so the balance shifts towards European countries and not nations in Asia or Africa. We'll explore the age of imperialism more in Unit 6. So you should be able to describe the relationship between the Qing dynasty and Europe in specific terms. Using specific terms. If you say something like, oh... The relationship between the Qing dynasty and Europe was one that involved restrictions on trade. No, that's not good enough. You need to say, after that pretty good introduction right there, an example of this is the Canton system. And then you need to describe the Canton system. I'm going insane. You guys are making me the joker, for God's sake. All right, and then uh, you should be able to compare uh, China to Japan and how Japan's interacting. That's pretty straightforward, I feel like. But again, you need to use specific terms. You are giving me the desire to jump into a pit of acid and then become the clown prince of crime. This is my Joker arc right here. You've made me the Joker, all of you. All of you watching at home, you made me the Joker. You did this. Society did this. I, I didn't do this. Society did. Actually, the College Board did. Let's blame the College Board. College Board made me like this, but you reinforced it. It's your fault. You're all to blame. You're all terrible. I should not be a teacher, come to think of it. I blame you too much for everything in my life. Well, it's not. My life is going fine. It's like none of you are causing stress within my personal life. It's just mostly in my professional life. Or you're giving me straight up aneurysms. I'm gonna be in the hospital by the end of this uh, by the end of this year, I think, because you guys cannot give specific examples. You're not only hurting me; you're hurting Jesus too. Jesus is really upset with all of you, and by Jesus, I mean this dude named Jesus that I know. Anyway, let's keep going. So, some changes in the Qing Dynasty. Well, for one thing, it is important to remember China's population is increasing, and why is it increasing? Well. We have to go back to the Columbian Exchange, actually. The Chinese population will increase after 1500 as a result of new crops from the New World. Things like potatoes and corn will lead to a massive population increase. More food means more people means bigger population. And this will lead to a lot of environmental problems as well. Oh, boo-hoo, the poor environment. Deforestation, soil erosion, overpopulation. So we do see that this is actually going to help us describe the weakness 
of the Qing dynasty in the future. Environmental stresses will cause more famines, which will lead to a lot of population unrest. So we do see that kind of more people will need more food, and this more food is going to come at the expense of the environment. Awesome. So what are other problems in the Qing dynasty that will ultimately lead to internal weakness? Well, for one thing, we have economic class conflict between the landlords, and landlords are people who own land and rent it to peasants. These guys are insanely wealthy. The people that have to pay rent to them are insanely poor. Wow, there's a huge class conflict. Hopefully that doesn't lead to problems in the future. Hint, it definitely will. There's a reason. Never mind, we'll get into that later. All right. So we also see other economic problems. This wealth gap is not only apparent in rural parts of China, but in urban centers as well. Urban centers tend to be areas where we see more explicit examples of poverty, more unemployment, less people living on land, more homeless people, etc. Urbanization leading to further class conflict, to further poverty. Shoot. We also see a general problem that the Chinese government eventually will become too corrupt. They're going to charge high taxes. They're not going to pay very high wages. Peasants tend to be pretty mad at that. You know, peasants are mad when they're not getting paid a lot of money. Teachers are mad when they're not getting paid at money. And they tend to take that out on students, actually, by saying to them that they need to provide more specific examples in their writing. Um, so, yeah, so we see that happening. Uh, Confucianism also leads to class tensions in general. Confucianism, remember, stresses the importance of a hierarchy, and people tend to not like to think that people are better than them, so there's class conflict there, especially if you're a peasant or a merchant or a lower class person in general. We also see ethnic tensions as well. Remember, the Qing dynasty are ethnically Manchu. They are ethnically from Manchuria. They are ethnically not from China. They are Central Asian nomadic groups of people. And they're ruling over ethnically Han Chinese people. There are a whole bunch of different Chinese uh, ethnicities, uh, but the Han are an example of that. There are five, as we'll talk about in the future, that contribute to the flag of the Chinese Republic, but we'll talk about that later. But one example, actually, of this ethnic tension that does exist between the majority of China's population, the Han Chinese, and the minority of Manchu is going to be actually in how the Manchu have a kind of class hierarchy that preferences Central Asian nomadic people against native Chinese people. And a way to kind of determine who is ethnically Chinese, meaning Han Chinese, and who is Manchu is expressed in something known as the Q haircut. And the Q haircut essentially is shaving the front half of the hair for men, for men, of course, and then the back is braided into a long ponytail, essentially. So uh, the Q haircut is an example of how ethnic hierarchies are reinforced. All right. So you should be able to identify some social changes during the Qing dynasty. Think about some social stresses. And I apologize to your little ears if they were hurt by me yelling at you. But you need to understand. You need specific evidence in your writing. You need to use systems of labor. You need to use specific empires, diseases, technologies, people, etc. You are going to be the death of me. We're doing terms quizzes from now on, people. That's going to be a component of your reading quizzes. And I might, this might date me so much. Who knows what the class is going to look like next year? You know, I'm learning. I'm a, a man is an adaptable creature. You know, Charles Darwin said that, I think. And Charles Darwin is one of the most evil people in world history. All right. Have a grand day. I'm sorry I yelled at you, but I hope you get the message across. This is going to be a, a good, uh, I hope this was a good semester. Hope you learned something. And if you didn't, I don't know what to tell you. I, I honestly don't know what to tell you. Maybe you learned to use specific examples. <laughs> oh my God, you, you expect to get a five on the AP and you're not giving specific examples in your LEQ, DBQ, or SAQs? Wowee. Uh, meme check here, but like, uh, that's an epic fail. I'm going to like die or something. All right. Have a great day.